Good morning, everyone. Apparently, I'm giving a quick, uh, did you say quick presentations? Right, okay. Um, so uh, over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to be going through a lot of our predictions that we have made. Um, I don't have time to go through them all. So I wanted to set the expectation that look, if there's any of the predictions on the board that you see that you go, I'd like to know a little bit more about that, you know, what are you referring to, please um, ask us in the Q&A or we can go into more detail. I'll just be picking out the ones that I think are most relevant, um, particularly to organisations uh, in this room uh, in Singapore and in ASEAN. So the theme of my presentation is be alert, not alarmed. Right? It's, well, <sighs> We're, we're allegedly facing economic headwinds, right? You know, this is a, the, the one caveat I will give around any of my economic discussion is that you know, the economic analysis that I read um, are the same people that didn't predict the current you know, unemployment rates, that didn't predict the current inflation rates, et cetera. Um, and they are all predicting you know, a recession in the US maybe later this year, a recession in Europe, um, a slowdown in Asia, um, etc. And we have seen that a lot of organizations in this room alone have started to lay off staff in North America and Europe and some here in Asia Pacific. Um, it was interesting to note just last night, I was reading this morning, that um, uh, a vendor came out you know, with a 8% layoff and it's the first time I've seen one of them mention a slowdown in customer spend. So I thought that was interesting that they've actually said that in the statement. Because right, the rest of them just all sort of talk about wanting to be more efficient and that we over-expanded our business, etc. Um, there's really positive spin that they're putting on it. And this is the first one that said, actually, we're seeing a, a slowdown in customer spend at the moment. Um, so we do expect a slowdown. We, I've spoken to organizations in Asia Pacific, in Singapore, that have staff freezes, um, that aren't allowed to employ new people, that if someone leaves, they're not, not allowed to replace them or it's really hard to replace them. Right? So um, there's going to be less staff employed. The unemployment rate is going to go up. That's um, sort of, you know, uh, I think that's certainly already happening in uh, many countries in the region and across the globe. But what I see about the, trend, the slowdown, maybe recession that we are moving into, that's different than every other one that I believe we've ever had is I speak to organizations who are still talking about accelerating their transformation, right? So this isn't a slowdown where we go into our shells and have less activity like we did during COVID, for example. Um, this is a slowdown where organizations, a lot of them are gonna be going, you know what, I got too fat, I got lazy, right? I, I'm actually want to come out of this um, economic slowdown, these econo economic headwinds and be a better organization, a leaner, meaner organization. And that means accelerating their transformation, accelerating the digital initiatives, the business initiatives they've got going, um, accelerating their innovation, which I'll be talking about a bit too. So um, there's a really different feel at the moment. We see this in our data, right? That people are saying we will have less headcounts and there are some areas of IT spend that are still expected to grow at 30% this year. Right? So they're saying, yes, we will continue to spend on technology, but we won't have the people to implement it. And that's an interesting challenge that I'll be talking about during the next 17 minutes or so. So um, right, jumping into the predictions, and there's a, a lot of content on these slides. As I said, I'll be picking out one or two from each slide to go into a little more detail. So first of all, fascinating that we're seeing big ticket innovation is back on the agenda. So um, if you've been in the IT industry for 15, 20 years, you'd know about these sort of waves of innovation that we used to talk about. You know, around, on average, seven years waves of innovation. The first couple of years, we'd deploy new technologies. Um, we'd make existing technologies do things that they could never, were never designed to do. Um, and then we'd spend a few years betting it down and then a few years profiting from it before we'd move into that next wave. Now, a few things happened to bring these waves into sync, and Y2K was one of them. So that's why you saw a lot of organizations in sync in their um, innovation initiatives. And we've seen that COVID is one of these moments, right? So COVID, we all went into our shells, or a lot of our clients went into their shells, you know, let's just get through it. We've come out um, the other side, we're seeing growth, but our growth was, over the last year or two has been, 
let's sell more of what we already do. Well, this is in our clients, you know, in the end user community, um, banks, etc. You know, it's not let's create a whole new products, it's let's just do more of what we do to return ourselves to profitability. And now we are seeing CEOs of banks and telcos and you know, large manufacturers across the region talk about innovation again. We're seeing in our data too, where it's jumped up as do a, in some countries, number one or number two on the list of priorities for businesses. And this isn't the ongoing continual improvement innovation, right, that we just expect these days. These are the big things. This is moving into new markets, reinventing the business uh, for new opportunities, going after new customer bases, uh, mergers, acquisitions, uh, looking at new industries, etc. Um, the, the real invention stage of, of innovation. So that's definitely back on the agenda. So we expect a lot of exciting big changes over the next 12 to 18 months uh, in uh, the, the business community. And I won't be focusing too much on this because uh, uh, Pete coming after me uh, will give a great presentation uh, uh, referencing sustainability. But it's worth understanding sustainability is becoming part of RFPs, right? Um, companies are expecting your business to be sustainable and your products and solutions to make them more sustainable. We're seeing it emerge in IT RFPs. Fascinatingly, we're seeing it much more in ASEAN than anywhere else in the region. So, you know, that includes Australia, New Zealand, India, China, etc. So, ASEAN is really leading the way in IT sustainability as a requirement. This is from both the, the public and private sector. Um, so, that's going to become one of the big drivers of, uh, of change this year. Uh, the distributed enterprise, I'm just going to talk about one of them here, and this is the, uh, the waste that we have within our cloud contracts. Right? A lot of organizations have embraced public, private, hybrid clouds, um, and with the slowdown, there's going to be an over-provisioning. You know, we've committed to a certain amount of um, workload going forward, etc., that we won't be using, we're by services that we're not sure if they're being used anymore um, within our business. So we're already seeing some organizations start to audit their cloud usage. Um, they're just trying to get rid of waste, excess spend within their business. Fascinating to see a whole new set of providers emerge around this space. There's a company called Spot.io that if you've pre-committed to a certain amount of workloads from um, AWS or Azure, for example, um, and you're not using them, you can actually resell them through Spot.io. Um, you know, on this sort of secondary market. Um, and it's fascinating seeing that, you know, the, the new markets are emerging to help organizations reduce their waste. Um, for the intelligent enterprise space, for the last few years, a lot of organizations, big banks, big telcos, you know, nearly every business has said, we want to be a cloud-based business. We want to be in the cloud. That's going to be our goal as an organization. And the reality is that the cloud's just a place. Like, it's not a destination. It's not somewhere that you, you know, it's not a business goal to be a cloud company. Right? What's, what do they even mean to be in the cloud? The cloud is just an enabler of your business to be a better organization, right? To do the things you need to do to provide great experiences for your customers, for your employees, for partners, etc. So we're seeing just a change of language in our client base that so they're saying, well, actually, we want to be AI-based intelligent businesses. We want to offer a personalized experience to every customer. And this has a massive impact. Because we think of all the applications, all the systems you've put in over the last 20 years um, that are about automating processes and having one way of doing this process in the business. Businesses are now actually saying, we want a different way of doing this for every customer. Right? And that's where AI is going to be leading a lot of this change. Um, but they're talking about AI as their transformation goal, not cloud. Now, it will be enabled by cloud. There's no question of that, right? But we're just seeing the people going, well, it's not about cloud anymore, right? We're there or we're getting there. Um, it's about us being an intelligent enterprise. Um, in this economic slowdown, we also expect businesses to start to quietly no longer talk about this concept that AI is not going to replace humans. Right, you know, a lot of organizations, organizations in this room have said this, oh, you know, it's, well, we're going to assist humans, we're going to um, make it easier for humans to do their jobs, but AI isn't going to replace humans. The reality is that it has already replaced humans, um, and organizations are just going to quietly abandon that stance um, as costs become a challenge. 
and we're going to see AI replacing human jobs in marketing and sales and service desk and customer service, etc. As I said, it's already happening, right? It's just an acceleration of that trend uh, this year, being driven by the slowdown that's going to happen across um, the globe and particularly some countries. Now, there's been a number of big cyber security incidents. Um, in, I know in Australia there's been some um, across the region, in the US and Europe uh, over the last six months that have heightened um, security as an issue for organizations. Now, the first instinct was, well, how about we you know, toughen up our security stance? Um, and then organizations are all starting to acknowledge that, you know, there are going to be breaches, right? There already have been breaches. Nearly every organization um, has been breached multiple times. The challenge is understanding when you have been breached. I saw some data from Ponemon Institute that uh, said that I think it's eight months on average for an organization to uh, find out that they've been breached, right? So detecting an incident and then responding to that, both the security response and the data response, but also the, the customer response and the regulator response and the government response is going to be the focus for a lot of security teams this year. Um, regulators are also looking at these incidents across the region. I know this is happening in Australia, um, in a couple of ASEAN countries where they're saying, well, why do you even have this data? Like, like I, I got impacted by the Optus hack in Australia where my driver's license that I gave them 12 years ago, right, they've still kept on file. Like I, there was a point in time being saying to identify that I am Tim Sheedy. I identified myself and they went, we're just going to keep that forever now, right? And regulators started to go, why? Why are you keeping this data? And they're going to start enforcing um, rules around deleting data, only keeping customer data for a certain length of time, et cetera. And that's going to drive a lot of interesting activity around data strategies, data governance, data management, data fabric platforms, et cetera, um, in, in, in the way organizations collect and store data. Um, I know the, there's a general principle that it's you know, the organization that doesn't, doesn't have any confidential data that's the safest one, right? Hackers, who cares? What are you going to get? Um, now, not many organizations are like that, um, but um, that's this increasing view that I see out in the market, that people are questioning what data do we collect, why do we collect this data, where, how do we store, and more importantly, when do we delete this data? Because records deletion is a significant challenge for a lot of businesses. I know there's one that I've worked with in Australia that worked out that if they deleted everything that they needed to delete to be compliant, it was going to cost them $400 million. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's the, the, the cost of not doing it right the first time. Um, now, that has an impact, right? If you are collecting less data, doesn't that mean you can't do as much AI? Because we need massive amounts of data to, do, to learn from, right, for our algorithms. So what we're seeing a lot of activity at the moment is organizations focusing on collecting and storing metadata, right? So they are maybe, you know, having a transaction with a customer, um, thinking that they'll actually delete that information straight away, but just keep some metadata about that transaction so they can learn, so they can offer me that great personalized experience or you that great, you know, um, customer experience that you demand going forward. So, you know, um, you know categorizing, storing, uh, metadata is going to be, well, already is starting to be a focus and we're seeing data teams and compliance and risk teams really focus on that at the moment. So that's the predictions piece of it, right? There were a lot of other ones that I didn't touch on. Please, if you've got any questions about them, uh, feel free to ask. There are just are a couple of things that I haven't mentioned that weren't in the predictions, um, you know, one of which has been in the news a lot recently. Um, that I will be talking about last year. But I thought there are a few other, what I call the unintended consequences this year. So in a slowdown, one of the consequences is the fact that um, there'll be less employees. Right? You know, when unemployment increases, you won't have as many employees in your, in your businesses. Now, when you're a SaaS company or a cloud company and you sell based off activity or number of employees, this directly impacts you. Right, we see in the North, North America in particular, 
you know, SaaS companies are really worried. Their, their revenue is going to go backwards pretty hard in a hurry. But it is going to happen in some countries here in Asia Pacific too. Um, the, the, the comment I want to make about this is how you respond to this as, as a provider will dictate your perception in the market going forward. What I mean by that is that um, I've spoken to a couple of buyers of you know, SaaS apps recently and they've heard rumors that their SaaS providers are going to bump their prices up to compensate for the fact that you know, their license, their seats are going down. And they don't like that. They're not fans of that particular outcome. You know, they're in a time when you know, budget's harder to come by in their business. They don't want their suppliers to be bumping their prices up. Um, and so I know one of a particularly large SaaS provider, one company told me just last week that, well, if they do it, we'll stick with them for a little while, but eventually we're going to replace them because that's just not the sort of organization we want to deal with. So it's going to be interesting how we respond won't just you know, dictate our success this year, but over the next few years. Because you know, I think in the, in the end user world, you know, revenge will be swift, uh, as, as the saying goes. <laughs> Another interesting trend is product-led growth. Now, I know a lot of organizations in this room are starting to take their products down the product-led growth approach. Right? You are currently services-led. You have you know, channel partners and systems integrators, et cetera all set up to, to help sell and integrate your solution. And there are you know, smarter people than me sitting in the product team going, how do we make it so our customers can just buy this direct? How do we make it so our customers can just implement this really easy in, this, in their business without the need for a systems integrator, a channel partner, et cetera? Um, and this is being accelerated by the slowdown, particularly in the US, as US vendors are going, we want to keep more of the revenue. We want to share less with our partners, right? You know, this is how we're going to get growth by keeping more of the revenue ourselves. Product led is going to help us with that uh, approach. Now, I'm not suggesting everyone's going to be wildly successful with this, but when you look at Asia Pacific, we are a very channel heavy market. Very, like even Asia Pacific businesses do most of their sales through the channel. Now, when you take a product where you've got a whole channel ecosystem around it, and you say, we don't need you anymore, ecosystem because we're going to go direct. What happens to that channel ecosystem? Right? They're going to have to adapt and change. Um, they're probably not going to like you that much. This is, is part of it too. Um, the good news is that if you look at the AWS um, and, and Azure, these um, existing companies where the channel partners are all about value add, they're not about integration because integration happens when you put your credit card in and hit you know, buy and then it just works straight away, right? So that channel ecosystem's already come to terms with this new world of value in, um, you know, in the services space um, and less about the you know, bums on seats trying to get this stuff to work in your business. So um, that's going to be a big change. And the final one, and I think this is just going to be fascinating, and I love Microsoft for what they've done here, is um, the $10 billion investment in OpenAI, or the, the, the planned $10 billion investment. Um, you know, chat GTP, GPT, sorry, um, as you know, someone I was speaking to just yesterday, uh, he said it's like AI has gone from nothing to the most amazing thing in the world in four weeks. And he's right. Like, you know, we're all looking going, wow, this is incredible. And think what $10 billion is going to do, right? What the great today will be considered child's play in two years' time, right? So why I love what Microsoft has done is they are accelerating AI spend. They're accelerating AI technology, but, you know, and we've already seen that the other big AI platforms are out there seeking finance. One of them's already got six or seven hundred million, um, you know, to keep them going forward. So there's going to be a response in the market, right? And we're going to see greater competition between these AI platforms. And this slow march to AI that was happening is just going to suddenly turn into a hundred meter sprint, right? And that's exciting. I think you know the, the changes we'll see over the next couple of years are going to be incredible but like I, I look at you know this presentation in two years time am I going to go to PowerPoint um, so PowerPoint I'm giving a presentation on our predictions this year um, can you put a deck together here are the people in the audience tailor the, the content to them and then I say and now I'm going to present it next week in Australia can you read you get to, to, to an Australian audience right that that could happen right and that could be a few short years away right in, in terms of um, what AI will do to our 
um, uh, capabilities in, with technology and be able to deliver things quickly. However, um, unintended consequences are going to be massive and they are all being accelerated. Content providers or content creators are already pushing back. They're going, well, you know, OpenAI is stealing my content and they're making you know, enable to other people and not showing where that content, that, that, that content was originally created by me, right? Um, we're seeing it happen particularly in the, you know, um, the like artists who are saying, you know what, I'm going to start putting all my content in a walled garden, right? Because I don't want the AI engines to get to it anymore. I don't want them to be able to steal my IP. Musicians are starting to do that too. Um, and, you know, it'll probably happen at an accelerated rate on news sites, business sites, information sites, etc. cetera. Um, so there's going to be a change in the way information is accessible. This is going to change the web as we know it today. I think we'll see an accelerated rate of adoption of blockchain um, because to prove provenance of content, to show that that's my content, that I created that. Um, and so when ChatGPT takes it, there's a link back to my original content. Um, and so I think that's going to be a fa fascinating change. One that I just want to leave you with you know, going forward is, so in five years' time, when most of the content on the web has been created by AI, the AI will be learning from content created by AI. And what does that mean to content and thinking? Do, we all, do, do all ideas converge? Right? Or, or, or do we move to two, you know, do we diverge into two different ideas, for example? I, I don't know the answer to that one, but what I know is that Microsoft's $10 billion investment is going to get us the answer to that question much faster than we were going to get there otherwise. And that's really exciting. I think that's really cool. I'm, I'm really excited for the future um, of AI in particular. And one last point I wanted to make, and I'll just leave you with this one, is that... Um, you know, we often use these terms, like the, the, the US century, you know, which went from 1940s to 1980s, 90s. You know, the, the Chinese century, which went from um, the 90s through to about now. Um, and now people are talking about the Indian century. So you probably get this idea that there isn't ever a century. <laughs> right. I understand the Australian century is going to come next. Um, <laughs> um, but, but this is what's being talked about. And, and like, you just look at the economic growth, right? So all these parts of the region and of the world are going, well, we're going to go in recession or low growth. India's going, not nah, 7% this year. Right? They're, they're expecting significant growth this year. Um, because of the economic stability and political stability in India, which you know, is one of the first times we can say that about that country, um, we are seeing you know, large global manufacturers either pull out of China or start to um, put excess capacity outside of China, and India is very well positioned to take a lot of that excess capacity. Uh, what's hugely exciting about this opportunity is over the next 10, 15 years, what, three, four hundred million people will be pulled out of poverty and bought into the middle class in India. And they all become consumers of your products, your services, or your um, customers' products and services. Um, so that's going to be exciting. Um, I know when I speak to a lot of people about this, there's questions about can they manage it, will they you know, will, will they sort of mess it up along the way? Um, I, I like to think, like I look at organizations in this room and go, what if you actually have Indian native, you know, CEOs, right? Who are some of the best CEOs we've seen in the IT sector ever, right? Who are driving incredible innovation at such a rate within your businesses. And I say, and my theory is if that happens in India to Indian organizations, those same leaders, types of leaders, start to drive that economy forward, we're in for a hell of a ride. I think you know, India is going to be a really exciting growth market um, for every business in this room. I, I really think in a couple of years' time, it will be your biggest market opportunity. Right? Now, whether you know, there are questions, will they make the same mistakes with technology that we all made right? in terms of the generations of tech, or will they jump to the latest and greatest? I'd like to think they're going to jump to the latest and greatest and to enable that massive growth that they're going to see. Right, they're going to need new systems, new cloud-based capabilities, new applications, you know, um, payroll systems that can scale up massively, et cetera. So um, you know, the opportunity from this particular one, I think, will be the biggest one 
in the future, right? Maybe not this year, right, as they're, as they're scaling up, but in the future, when the US comes out of recession and starts to expand its manufacturing capabilities around the planet, I think India is going to see a lot of that, and that's just going to drive fantastic growth um, for India and this region. So I will leave you with that. Thank you very much.